Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar about data science for supply chain. I would suggest we wait one other minute to have some more people join, and then we can get started. In the meantime, just one first information about, um, the, about some organizational staff. If you have any questions, we do have a question and answer session planned at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please put them in the um, chat box, which you can see below the webinar screen, where you can also see some attachments and links that we have added for you as a further information. Okay, so I think let's get started. So thank you again for everybody who just joined for joining us in our webinar about data science for supply chain. I am Marie, I'm, a, I'm an account executive for Switzerland at DataIQ, and I'm here today with Ali, who is a sales manager for data and AI from Microsoft, and with Jesus, and Jesus is a data science and artificial intelligence expert at Japan Tobacco International, and he will present GTI use cases in supply chain today. Again, as I mentioned before, but I'm going to say it again, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A uh, box that you can see below the webinar screen, and we will be able to answer the questions in the end. And with that, I would suggest we can get started. So Jesus, can you please forward the slide? And you can go right on to the next one. Thank you very much. So what I want to share a little bit with you about is what we do at DataIQ. And I want to start with a study that Accenture released last year stating that 80 to 85% of all organizations actually have initiated their digital transformation journey. But obviously, this journey or this transformation does not happen from today to tomorrow, but it requires technological and cultural change. And in order to succeed in deploying and in scaling AI, companies need to ingrain a culture of working with data throughout the enterprise instead of siloing it into specific teams or roles. And this is precisely our goal at DataIQ, to enable organizations to drive this transformation and to implement it in a human-centric way. Next slide, please. And with this vision to ingrain the data into every team and into every role, we have built our platform that provides one single interface for the entire data pipeline, from data preparation to model building, deployment, monitoring, and everything in between. And as we want to support every possible user group within organizations, DataQ has been built from the ground and from the start up to enable the business experts and the non-coders to work with code and click features in the visual interface, whereas at the same time, data scientists can leverage robust coding features such as Python, R, SQL, and others. And this aspect of openness and inclusivity does not end here, but because obviously each company's path to enterprise AI looks differently and technologies change very quickly, it's also really important to be agnostic when it comes to technology and the underlying infrastructure of our customers. This means that DataIQ is completely agnostic with regards to the underlying infrastructure or architecture, and this obviously also means that we have many valuable tech partners with whom we collaborate. Next slide, please. And obviously, such a tech partner is, for example, Microsoft. Um, and with Microsoft today, we have a strategic partnerships for, for more than four years. And one interesting metric might be actually that 20% of our customers are on Azure today. So obviously, close collaboration and integration with these two technologies between DataIQ and Microsoft is very important. And with that, Ali, it's your turn. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, uh, Marie. Um, so if we move to the next slide um, and we take uh, a step back, basically this, uh, this whole underlying data science platform uh, is to help organizations become more data driven. And what we use within Microsoft um, to explain to our customers and enterprises on uh, how to become data driven is the concept of a digital feedback loop. It's not a surprise to you that pretty much every asset, be it a physical asset or an employee or a customer, is, is more and more uh, transmitting and, and uh, data, uh, and data is being captured by all those assets, including a product telemetry. And it's really when you put all those assets together, um, that you, and when you leverage that central data that you can be able to regenerate insight, which translates in actions. So if, I don't know if you're going to see the animations here, but basically, um, if we take as an example, if we take an example, within Microsoft a few months back, we had seen um, a reduced uh, amount of satisfaction with a specific customer segment in a specific geography. Um, after drilling down into that um, by using some signals that we get from, from Office 365, completely anonymous, we see, for example, that the customer sales representative or all the customer facing roles of that specific unit in that specific region were spending less time in customer facing meetings than the average. Okay? Again, this is completely average on a on a on a unit level and nothing and nothing as specific to an individual. So after drilling down further with that insight, they found out that that unit was actually spending too much time on rhythm of business meetings. And you can see that by looking at the amount of meetings that are spent with N plus one and N plus two. Um, and obviously, the more time you spend internally is the less time you spend with your customers. And they have basically readjusted the way they manage that entity to do much less internal meetings and much more customer-facing meetings, which translated into increased customer satisfaction. That's just an example of showing when you capture signals through all those pillars and you build that insight, uh, you are able to make actions and take actions that actually uh, improve every single one of those pillars as well. So if, if we move on as well to, through the slides, that basically um, have us, actually can move ahead through the animation because I just went through it. <clears throat> that basically um, brings us to discussing with customer what you see on the next slide, some guiding principles on how to choose a strategic data platform. Um, and there are different guiding principles around that. I just want to walk you through a few on the next slide. Um, like, for example, the data, strategic data platform that you want to use and all the surrounding ecosystem solutions has to, you know, uh, basically mimic the end-to-end -end data lifecycle. I don't know, Francis, can we just move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So it has to mimic the end-to-end -end, uh, data lifecycle. So the modern data estate platform that you bring and all the surrounding solutions have to, you know, empower the full data lifecycle, all the way from ingestion to getting to the BI and AI uh, on the other side of the spectrum. It also should help you and enable you to leverage your data on your terms, wherever that data resides, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise or on the edge. You choose where your data is, and you choose how to leverage that data. Of course, leveraging economies of scope for us is critical, so you are seeing the four pillars there. If you have a huge amount of silos and you spend the majority of your time integrating data and you know, bringing all that data, making sense together, you are actually doing quite a lot of plumbing work. And that's why all of our uh, solutions that were behind that digital feedback loop come up with integrated uh, data integration points through something we call a common data model and common data service that allows you much faster to leverage solutions that you have, which, uh, such as Data IQ, to be able to, like, to get that, to that insight. And then I just want to go through the, um, through the last point here. Um, that data platform should allow you very quickly to get to that application and AI innovation, leveraging our ecosystem of partners such as Data IQ. Now, if we just on the last part from, uh, from my perspective, if we move on the next slide, what do we mean by a modern data estate? So with the, um, the Microsoft data platform, which is basically on Azure, and we can walk through the animations here as well, it's really, as I was saying, cover the end-to-end -end spectrum, all the way from, from ingestion to doing, you know, building AI models on top or using pre-built AI models with Azure Cognitive Services such as the Vision API or Face Recognition APIs, right? 
while doing that in a hybrid manner, right? So whether on-prem uh, with SQL Server, for example, or in the cloud with all the Azure data platform, or on the edge. So now we have the ability to, uh, to leverage SQL on the edge. Um, um, and, you know, leveraging all of our BI capabilities and AI capabilities from Azure or from our partner ecosystem. So that was in a nutshell to put things into perspective on how uh, the discussion of today fits within our Microsoft data strategy. And then uh, now Marie is going to walk us through a little bit more the integration point from data IQ. Marie? Yes, excuse me. So just really quickly, what are the integration touch points that we have today between DataIQ and Microsoft? Just to mention a few ones, or perhaps the ones that speak to the most of you, you see that we enable collaboration with Microsoft Teams, for example. We also do have the possibility to directly visualize data in um, Power BI through DataIQ to facilitate visualization across organizations. And we also, for example, have a native integration with Kubernetes and Cognitive Services. So you can see here that we really the Data IQ and the Microsoft ecosystem are closely linked into one another. And with that, Jesus, I would like to hand over to you to share your journey at Japan Tab Tobacco International. Thanks. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, uh, Ali. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Taiku for inviting me and, and allowing me to, to share our experience and also thank the audience for joining. Hope this will be helpful. Okay, the agenda on my side today is, is quite simple. I will briefly present JTI and, and our supply chain to give you some background and an idea of, of the challenges we face every day. Then I will show you how we are applying data science and artificial intelligence, uh, solving three different use cases at different points of our supply chain. And finally, I will summarize uh, the main takeaways. Okay, so um, JTI is one of the biggest companies, uh, tobacco companies in the world. We are more than 45,000 employees. Uh, we have presence in, in, in over seven countries around the world uh, with more than 400 offices, lots of factories, and tobacco processing facilities. Um, probably you already know some of our, our brands. Uh, we sell them in, in more than 130 countries and regions. Uh, so you can imagine how, how big and uh, the challenges we, we face. And we have also some, some other products, all the tobacco products like uh, Roll Your Arm, Sista, Figas, and of course, Review Strix uh, products with our brands like uh, Logic and Implement. Okay. For, for our global supply chain, again, a couple of slides to, to give you uh, an idea of the challenges we, we face. Uh, global Supply Chain is the biggest function in JTI. We are more than 26,000 employees here. We produce more than 400 billion cigarettes per year, um, more than 9,000 SKUs in 29 factories. Our footprint is all around the globe. Uh, factories, leaf origins, uh, threshing plants. And of course, that means uh, lots of challenges from supply chain point of view. And our structure is, is probably very similar to other uh, companies uh, that, that uh, have uh, the full supply chain. We, we have some suppliers that uh, provide us uh, leaf, non-tobacco materials, and, and other products and services. Then we have to, to process uh, those materials, to store them, uh, to, to manufacture them, and finally we have to, to deliver uh, to our customers and consumers. In some in some markets and, and regions, uh, the delivery is done by by external distributors. In some others, we are the ones that are delivering to the to the points of sales. In some others, it's in a hybrid model. Um, we'll see we'll see some of these cases in the in the use cases I would like to present. So this is basically our structure: how how big we are, how big our supply chain is, and um, let me now uh, tell you our how how we are applying data science, artificial intelligence in, in all these levels of the supply chain. But before going to the, to the uh, concrete use cases, I'd like to, 
to show you why why we um, chose to 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 uh, put in place an artificial intelligence platform culture um, more or less one year ago. Um, so the situation at that time was, um, of course, everybody was already doing some some artificial intelligence and data sciences uh, proof of concepts. But um, it was very difficult to uh, share the knowledge we got in each of these uh, pubs. It was very difficult to uh, scale them to other markets. It was very difficult to reuse some of the parts, uh, some things we, we developed. And um, it was, in one word, it was very difficult to collaborate through all this big company. Um, so we chose, oops, sorry, we chose, uh, oh, shit. We chose to put in place um, artificial intelligence platform, uh, the Taiku, and the main the main goal was to uh, allow everybody to collaborate in this same place, to have all the pieces uh, together in one place, and all the knowledge, all the tools, all the roles, different roles working uh, in in data science and artificial intelligence projects, working all together to facilitate collaboration. That's uh, the the main driver, or the main reason why we put this in place. And now our mission, our goal is to um, fully leverage its potential. So during this first year, um, only a bunch of, of experts, I would say only a bunch of data scientists have worked in the platform. Now we, we want to scale it, this to, to the whole company and start making um, business analysts and people not so experts uh, start playing with platform, collaborating, and start getting more and more knowledge. That's, um, so that's Basically, the, the uh, path we followed uh, the last year and where we want to go. And now um, I show you um, some of the some of the challenges uh, we we have. Of course, uh, we have more more um, pilot and proof of concepts than the ones I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, but just uh, I would like to show you how we are applying data science at the different levels of the structure I, I showed you before. So first, at this level, we are we are we have a couple of actually a couple of projects uh, related to planning. We have to plan how how much leave do we need, how, how many materials do we need, and, and how much will they cost. So I will show you a use case about uh, planning, cash flow planning. At the second level, um, we I, I'm using uh, I'm showing a use case about manufacturing. Uh, how we are using artificial intelligence, artificial vision in, in our factories to improve uh, the quality of our, our products. And finally, at the lower levels, I, I will discuss uh, a use case about delivering, how we are optimizing our delivery in, uh, in, in, in the market where, where we, we are the ones that are delivering to the, the point of sale. Okay? So these are basically the three use cases. Um, first one is, is cash flow forecasting about planning. So the situation here is uh, every month uh, our entities have to forecast the incoming and outgoing cash flows of the next uh, 12 months. So it's a 12 month rolling forecast regarding, uh, um, so it, it is not that we are planning the demand, we are planning how much will we spend in different, uh, in how much will we get in different uh, movements, but it's, it's related somehow. And how is the problem solved today? The, the, the manual planning, well, uh, you can imagine the forecasters have to uh, gather all the information from many different data sources, put it all together, spend some time in analyzing all those informations uh, and, and produce the forecast and, and upload to the, to the system. That is translated to uh, approximately 400 hours on a daily basis and around 30% error overall. It depends on, on, the, on the horizon you, you're looking at, uh, one month or 12 months, but it's, it's around 30% error. So the, our goal here was to um, automate this process. It's not to replace the forecaster. Uh, of course, his business knowledge is very useful. His expertise is very useful, but we want to make his life easier and allow him to focus in the task where he can really add value. So. Um, we, the, the idea is to, to automate all this process and produce the forecast so he can review and, and correct the ones he knows from his expertise and business knowledge he knows that are uh, probably wrong. Okay. How are we doing this? Well, we, we are applying um, agile methodologies. So we, 
we use uh, this uh, four, three weeks sprint model. Um, the first sprint, we, we, what we did is, is we usually analyze data quality. We define the scope. We found that, uh, okay, we had almost uh, 3,500 uh, time series, but uh, 500 of, of them covered more than 80% of the, of the scope, and actually they had the, the, the most data quality, probably because they are the most uh, important ones. So we focus on those. We define the metrics we were using during the um, during the, the, the POC, and we uh, also develop the baseline models. This step is is quite important, I would say. Uh, so we are sure from the very beginning that we have um, a model up and running. We have something tangible that we can uh, test against the, the next experience. We can check the improvement we get from different um, uh, fine tuning we we do. Uh, so I would say. Getting a model as soon as possible is is uh, very useful for this development. So then, in the in the next sprint, what we did is is try to um, uh, add new data sources and also try to improve the the algorithms. So, for example, here we try to use some internal factors and we failed, but at least we failed fast. We just in three weeks we discovered some some data sources and we improved the model with some seasonality and applied detection. Um, so that's that's the, the 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 philosophy. Try to improve over the baseline models, and you can always measure uh, what what is the impact of the of the data source or, or the technique you are you are using. Then on the third sprint, we try to add some external factors. Uh, we use some Bloomberg the monitor data, which again uh, were not useful. Were not useful to to improve uh, accuracy, but again we we failed fast. In three weeks, we we discarded it. We didn't spend. Uh, Two months in, in analyzing the data, and then we again improve the model. We're doing some assembling with the naive model, and finally we uh, added a new data sources data source uh, API AR data, which uh, really helped in the horizon zero, one, and two. No more than that, but we, we really improved the accuracy with that one, and put all, all everything together in the final model. So that was the the, the idea with this. Again, only 12 weeks of development. Uh, we got uh, quite good results. Um, so I'm showing only here uh, distance zero. So that means forecasting the coming month and distance 11. So the, the same month in the in the coming year. Uh, and the error we reduced the error in 30% or 50%, depending on the on the horizon. Again, that translates translates in uh, lots of millions better forecasted, and also saving uh, around 320 hours for the for our forecasters. So um, quite quite good results in in, in such a fast uh, project. Um, so the the lessons we learned here. Uh, three main lessons. First, um, keep it simple. Um, do not start with the fanciest state-of-the-art neural network. It's usually better to um, start with a with simple, well-known approach. Uh, and in many occasions, this simple approach already beats the manual forecast. So in, in this way, you, you can engage the, the business very, very fast. Uh, in just three weeks, in the first sprint, you, you get something that is already uh, improving. What they what they have, okay, and then you can you can using this agile approach you can keep improving and and at some point you can try this fancier technique you really like, but uh, I think it's better to start for the simplest thing. It's less risky and uh, much much easier. Then the second lesson we learned is uh, we shouldn't monitor only performance. We we data scientists usually um, focus on getting uh, the, the highest accuracy possible. So if we get um ninety five percent accuracy we we want to get ninety five point five percent if we can but uh, keep in mind that uh, no matter how good your model is is if if nobody uses it it's useless and, and that's the point so my suggestion here is is you should monitor also adoption rate is the people using the forecast you are sending uh, what we found uh surprisingly is that uh, at the beginning uh, the adoption rates were were very low. Only a few forecasts that we're using our our forecast. It was surprising because we got very very uh, good results, and we saw them the results. We we saw them they they were saving time, but um, there was a problem, and it's linked to the third um, lesson we learned. We, we 
you should spend time in educating people. So uh, usually people do not trust machines by default. And it's something understandable if you think about it. So uh, the lesson we learned is, is we should involve the, the final users from the very beginning. They, they should understand what's going on behind the scenes. This is not black magic. It's something that has some, some reasons to produce the forecast that it is producing. And it's, it's good to book some time from the beginning to explain the final user um, how the model works and why they are getting this before. OK? So this is basically an overview of the um, of the of, uh, of this uh, project. It's, it is already in in production. Every month, automatically, we get the the information. We produce the forecast, and we send uh, via email the the forecast to to the different forecasters of the different entities, and and they finally upload the the results to the to the system. Okay. So. Uh, Moving forward to the next case, if I can. I think this is the stack, Maurice. I I will change to a screen share, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's probably better. Yeah, let me. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Mm. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next, um, the next use case was uh, the um, the next stage in the in the uh, supply chain. Uh, this is about manufacturing uh, visual defects. It's called. Um, so the situation here is in, in one of our factories in in Eastern, Eastern Europe. We are producing around three million packs every day. Of different brands, of course, different SKUs, and uh, sometimes uh, we get some defects in the, in, the, in the packages. Of course, we have some quality control technicians to to manually check for these uh, defects. Um, they detect uh, around 3,000 defects per month, um, and they spend some some time checking it. So here, the goal is is to to leverage artificial vision techniques to detect these defects, so we can. Uh, reduce the the, the uh, software operator work and also uh, check more and more packages and, and improve uh, the detection accuracy. Okay, how we did that? It's um, this is actually a work in progress. By the way, we are still working on it. Um, so we put in place, in place a development loop. Um, first, we we select the defect we wanted to 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 detect. Uh, we chose one for the, for this uh, pilot. We select based on frequency, cost, the number of customer complaints related to the defect. And the one we chose is the, this improper film fold, where you can see the the film is, is wrongly folded. Okay. So once we selected the defect, we, we put in place a development loop, um, which allowed us to very fast check for um, two different techniques. Uh, we we use uh, Custom Vision, one of the community services uh, from Microsoft. And we also use our custom um, built uh, transfer learning approach with ResNet in, in Python. And we uh, keep continuously uh, training, evaluating, and checking for generalization to other, other brands. So um, the, one of the main uh, problems with uh, artificial vision uh, projects is that uh, data quantity uh, it's, it's difficult to, to get uh, enough data uh, fast. For example, in this case, you can imagine the defects are not produced very often. So we cannot get real images of defects uh, very fast. So uh, what we did is start developing as soon as possible once we have a very, very small sample, small but big enough. And then keep adding in this loop more and more uh, images once we, we get them. Okay, so we, we keep looping here. And once you, you are confident with the final with the final model, we will deploy the model in production and, and pilot getting the images with an industrial camera and, and the proper configuration. The important thing here is that data gathering should happen during the whole project because it's, it's difficult to get the data. So um, 
the message here is don't stop gathering data. Okay. And the results we got is okay. In the first iteration, we we use only one brand. This one SKU actually was this Wisdom Blue with 100 images, and the results we got um, were quite good for both approaches. Uh, probably custom vision needs um, a bigger sample. We use uh, 50 OK images, 50 de for defects, which is the bare minimum they they suggest. But probably with a, a bigger data set, we will get. Uh, Better results. Uh, for the second iteration, we added uh, eight brands with packages from different sites, colors, uh, even lighting. And again, we got pretty good results. We we tried with other trainings. We just uh, took this first model we got and without uh, feeding in these these images, just asked them to to predict. For custom mission was again difficult. But after retraining, we got uh, very good results in both cases. Again, for custom mission, probably we need a bigger sample. But the results we are getting, and we are starting with this with this um, project, are, are quite quite promising, quite promising, uh, very close to 100%. Um, so we are confident we can get very very good results in the, in the future. So the lessons learned here: um, first of all, already already told you, data gathering is usually a bottleneck. Data quantity uh, in artificial vision project is is usually an issue. It's something you you should Think about from the very beginning, even before the beginning, and, uh, and you should work in parallel. You should you shouldn't wait and you, until you have the full data set to start developing your solution because it, it might take a lot of time to get uh, I don't know 10,000 images with the proper quality. And also, if you wait, there's a there's a, a chance that uh, when you start modeling with with the images with just start playing with the images, you realize that the quality or the lighting or whatever is not uh, Appropriate, and then you have to start again the again the data gathering. So um, it's useful to start as soon as possible. Once you have a minimum data set, the, the, the very minimum, you start developing, you start playing with the images, and then you realize if the quality is good, you can improve the data gathering process. You can get uh, better and better images um, uh, while you are developing. Okay. So the message is uh, keep gathering. Um, also, do not wait until the first iteration is finished uh, and then you gather. I didn't want to include the um, data gathering here in the loop because it's not something that uh, it's something that should happen in parallel. You shouldn't wait until one iteration is finished to gather more images. It's something that should happen in parallel because it's it might take uh, some time. The other the other lesson learned here is that uh, we should keep requirements in mind. Again, uh, that scientists we we usually um, like uh, or focus on on accuracy. Uh, we want to, to to get the highest accuracy possible. But uh, when you work with with deep learning and very complex networks, um, the complexity is in account too. I mean, if you have a requirement that you, the, the the classification or the prediction should be uh, ready in two seconds. Um, you should keep in mind that from the beginning, because if you use a very complex network, or you can train it, uh, and after spending a lot of time in, in, in fine-tuning it, then you you might deploy it and realize that it, it takes five seconds to um, to give you the prediction or the classification, and that's something you you don't want. Uh, then you have to start again. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't go for the biggest network uh, for the most complex uh, architecture. Uh, sometimes. A simpler network, uh, it's 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 more than enough, and uh, will will meet your your performance uh, requirements. Okay. These are the two main lessons for for this case, and now going to the um, to the last case. On, a, on the next level on the uh, on the supply chain, uh, we are also working on on delivering on fund loading optimization. Again, in in one market in Eastern Europe. On a daily basis, um, well, here the model is direct sales operation. That means we are the ones that uh, are bringing the, the uh, cartons to, to the points of sale. So we have to load our bands, uh, almost 300 bands, and um, visit the different uh, uh, points of sales, and, and, and then come back to the, to the warehouse and unload the band again. Okay? So um, somehow we have to, to, to plan the demand to know how much uh, 
we have to load of each product in each van to meet the, the demand, but uh, to minimize the, the loading and unloading of, of patterns. Okay, so um, the goal here is a uh, predict on a daily basis what is the, the amount of cartons that uh, we have to load in each of the vans, so depending on the, the points of sales they, they are visiting, uh, to reduce as much as possible the, the, the amount of cartons we, we load and unload, but of course without getting into out of stock. You don't want to, to load very, very few of them. Okay. So again, we, we put in place this, uh, we use this AI methodology, we use this uh, four, three weeks uh, sprints. And uh, the first sprint, we, we um, identified the data sources and we analyzed them, the, the data quality. We defined the, um, the metrics, so we are measuring the percentage of, of unloads, how many packages and cartons we have to to unload uh, every day uh, at the end of the day, and also the, the out of stock uh, level. Uh, again, we, we don't want to impact that, uh, that KPI. Uh, then second sprint, we, we try to, to, we detected some, some, uh, some errors uh, in, in the data, and we also added some, again, as in the first case, we added some, some uh, extra techniques to the algorithms we deployed in, in first sprint. So for example, here we uh, added a, a classifier that was saying yes or no, if a store was buying something or not. And we realized we should add an, uh, another uh, metric um, to, the, to the project, which is the, the percentage of cattle movement savings. Because the percentage of, of unload is, is not uh, very fair in the sense that if you reduce the, the number of cartons you are loading, probably you will reduce the, the, also the unloading, uh, but the, the number of cartons you are loading and unloading is, might, be, might be fewer. So this way um, we are measuring in a better way how, how much job we are doing in loading and unloading. Okay. That means we can, we, in following this agile methodology, we can adapt also the metrics, not only the data sets or the algorithms. If we realize that the metrics we are using are not uh, measuring perfectly what we want, we, we, we can adapt uh, during the development. Then in the third screen, we, we try to add some external factors like the weather, um, gear analysis. We, that we, we didn't get any, any accuracy improvement with them. Uh, we did some feature engineering based on, on trade control requests and price positioning, we, which really helped help a lot. And also we, we did some specific models for, for seasonal stores. Uh, some stores open only uh, during summer periods or whatever, so you don't have historical information. We, we did some, some models to, to um, work with this particular, particular case. Okay. And then in the fourth sprint, we we actually include the, the weather, the 15 days weather like feature actually uh, helped um, improve our accuracy. And, and finally, we ensembled all the different models we created. We put all the pipeline together um, to get the final model. So again, in in 12 weeks, we got the final model, but uh, we actually got it in in the first sprint, and we keep improving. So. It's, it's easier for the business to understand how things are moving, how you are improving, uh, what's the impact of the different features you are adding or the different uh, fine tunings you are doing to the, to the algorithm, okay? The results uh, are also um, quite good. Um, we reduced the percentage of unload up to uh, 15%, 50 percentage points, sorry. We didn't uh, impact the out of a stock level, so it, it remained in the same numbers. The uh, number of cartel movement was reduced in 25%. Also, the track and trace and scan counts were reduced, uh, 12 percentage points. And uh, the manual job that had to be done by the, by the um, sales officers and the, and the algorithms we deployed were actually working uh, much better for them. So also the process they have were, was, was improved with uh, the help of, of this project. Okay, so lessons learned in this case. Uh, first of all, the, the pilot creation, the initial setup. Uh, we, we use here that IQ and, and Databricks to, 
um, to use a spark and accelerate some some of the some parts of the flow. So we um, actually took a, a lot of time to integrate all the pieces. Uh, probably more than than the time it took to to uh, code the full the full project. But now maintenance, scalability, debugging, everything is is much easier and faster um, working on 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 the Taiku. So uh, it was uh, it was worth to do that the job. Then uh, about data quality, uh, improve from the overall quality of different data sets um, helped to assess the, the impact, um, leading in, in many occasions to accuracy improvements. So uh, probably you already heard about this, but keep an eye on data quality. Um, and finally, um, system integration can al also give you uh, some improvements. Uh, for example, if we, if we integrate the stock level of each point of sales, our prediction will, will uh, surely improve because the current stock situation is a good predictor of future shipment. So um, yes, the, the, the more data, the more, the more data sources you can try, the more data sources you can integrate in your system, the more information you have, and probably the more the, 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 the better predictions you will you will get. Okay. So that's basically the three use cases I I wanted to share with you at the three different levels of of our um, supply chain. And now um, I, I would like to finish with three takeaways, basically summarizing the most important points, the, the most important things we, we learned uh, through this journey in this last year using uh, .IQ. The first uh, message is, is KISS, uh, probably not very politically correct in these uh, COVID times, but uh, I mean, Keep it super simple. Um, again, do not start with uh, the most complicated data source. Uh, do not start with the fanciest uh, neural network. Start with uh, with a simple, well-known approach, the one that uh, has been tried before many, many times. Um, and then following an agile approach, you, you can keep improving, adding uh, data sources, uh, improving your, your baseline, your base algorithms. Um, and also, last message: fail fast. This this philosophy of keep, keeping things simple and, and improve on top of that allows you also to, to fail fast. Uh, you try something, and, and very easy you detect if it's improving over the the last sprint results or not. And you can discard or go uh, another way. Okay. Then the next um, the next uh, takeaway message is uh, check for quality. Um, we usually think that that algorithms is the is the key. We usually think that the very big neural network will solve all the problems. But uh, no matter how good your algorithms are, if you feed them with bad data, they will give you bad results. Uh, and that's, uh, that applies for for any algorithm you may you may find. But um, so it's important to check for for data quality. But uh, it's also important not to get obsessed with that and um, wait until you get 100% you get data quality. Uh, probably you will never get that. So um, my suggestion is to start playing with your data sets, uh, detect the data quality issues, tell to the business uh, and also suggest them how to, how to improve on that. Um, at some point you will get this solved and you will get uh, uh, data with, with more quality, but um, you should start working with the data because uh, Main reason is because it's the best way to detect these data quality issues. I mean, you can have a look to the data and uh, yes, the text one column has a lot of missing values, but if you don't really play, you don't really try to model uh, and, and yeah, do some, some, some models with the data, you won't find the real problems. You won't find the, the data quality issues that need really need to be solved. So the way is to uh, start modeling. Uh, spend a couple of weeks, uh, two or three weeks, uh, having a look to data quality and, and try to model something and get, a, again, a simple thing that uh, allows you to detect these, these issues, okay? And then last but not least, uh, I would say probably the most important, educate. Again, um, put attention on the data culture of your company. Um, try to explain in simple words, don't go into 
very deep mathematics, but I try to explain in simple words what the algorithms are doing, why they are um, forecasting what they are forecasting or what, why they are giving this classification for, for this particular case. Book some time from the beginning of the project to, to do these explanations. Uh, I mean, do not leave it for the end of the project. And uh, get them involved in the development uh, so they can, they can uh, understand the progress. And uh, all these with, with understandable language, plain language, understandable KPIs. It's very important to um, make them understand what's, what's going on in the machine and, and make them trust the machine and use your algorithm. That's, uh, I would say, probably the most important uh, takeaway message. And I think that's all on my side. We have um, some minutes for, for your questions. Any comments, feedback, whatever? Thank you, Jesus. We do have actually a lot of questions, so I will try to get through as many as possible. And many are for you, Jesus. I will start with you and then ask Ali later on some more questions. One question for you, Jesus, is um, what kind of analysis will you do in the data before applying data science algorithms in it? Yeah. Um, Mainly uh, devoted to data uh, quality. So what we what we do before starting any 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 pilot any project is is to um, get a, a sample of the data. We do a, a data assessment. So we we work um, well with the basic analysis like missing values and a couple of distributions. But then we try to build actually build uh, very simple models uh, to realize if there is potential or not in the in the data sets. If there's enough quality uh, or enough quantity, if if there is something to, we we can help. So we spend two or three weeks in having a look to the um, this data sample and and try to to find out if there is potential there. And that uh, the way might be probably just trying to build some some simple um, algorithms on top of it. All right, thank you. And can you share if your models are more machine learning or deep learning based? Uh, yes, um, we are using deep learning for the um, manufacturing, the artificial vision uh, project, basically transfer learning or, uh, with ResNet 50, and also uh, the custom vision, uh, one of the cognitive services from, from Microsoft, which is based on deep learning. Uh, the rest are basically what we call machine learning. Yes, it's it's um, or a statistical forecasting in the, in the case of the time series. Yes, so again, uh, deep learning probably is not useful for any case. You need a lot of information, a lot of data, uh, so it should be used when in the cases it, it can be of help. In this case, for the artificial vision case, yes. All right, and then we have another question about the. ML part, did you keep a part of your data set to estimate the final error, or did you use all your data during the validation process? Sorry, again, I couldn't hear at the beginning. Sorry, the question is if you kept a part of the data set to estimate the final error, or if you were using all the data to do the validation. No, no, we, 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 depending on the case, we, we use a train test uh, split. So we only show the model the training set and then we validate uh, our results with the test. We can do cross validation, again, depending. But uh, in all the cases, of course, we, we do a proper split and a proper validation process. Yes. So the numbers you show here are not with the training set, are, are with the test set. Yeah, to make sense. Um, do you can are you able to share any next analytical projects in your roadmap? Is another question. Uh, we do have different different things uh, for the for the planning uh, step. We are working on on demand and supply planning um, on our supply chain. We are also working on uh, trying to help our our graders with. Uh, the processes of creating the leaf and um, and some others. Yes, uh, actually, um, I just show you here three of them, but uh, the, the the 
potential of artificial intelligence and data science in our supply chain is, is huge, huge. Right, and then I'm, I might want to ask a question to Ali, a more a broader question, not specifically on this cases. What is your approach to involve business units and how to explain them the model behavior? So this is the black box versus white box approach this person is referring to. So that's a great, uh, a great question. Uh, let me answer that with two elements. First, um, to do more the left approach that was referred into the question, we use that was a saying uh, mechanism such as the business the digital feedback loop, which is really to start with the business use case where we believe data could be a differentiating value, a differentiating factor, right? So what is the blind spot that the organization has, right? Associated to which pain and how can, which type of data would actually help alleviate that, that's one. And then two, as with any organizational transformation, like you know, transforming an org into a data-driven org, change management is super important. And as such, having the right uh, sponsorship uh, within the organization is, is critical. You change your culture as well by changing the conversation one at a time. Um, so more and more what we see with customers is there are a lot of uh, small uh, tips and tricks where they involve data discussions in, in, in a lot of different rhythm of business and different meetings where they ask that question, which data could we leverage to improve our decision making? So really it's a, it's a culture change that needs to be driven. Yes, and I think this also um, goes together with another question that we have received about how to convince managers to use ML in business and processes. And I, I would agree, Ali, that this is probably not only, you know, a use case specific discussion, but also a lot around evangelization and how we can bring this vision to enterprise AI within the organization. Exactly, exactly. Great. Sorry, I have so many questions. I need to work a little bit through this. Um, Perhaps, Jesus, can you say something about how easy or how difficult it is to deploy models into production? Uh, actually, uh, I have to say that IQ is, is a great help uh, for that. Uh, I've, I've been struggling for in my past life. I've, I've been struggling uh, weeks, I would say, to deploy a given model. So sometimes even more time in trying to deploy it properly and, and, and put in place the the proper way to, to consume a model for the final user um, with that IQ is, is much easier. I would say it's one of the uh, one of the strengths. Uh, with, with a couple of clicks, you, you can set a scenario. And uh, for example, in the first case, we automate the, the, the flow run and we send um, the email, the forecast to each forecaster. Um, yes, with a couple of clicks. And also for, for other cases, we are using the API node. And again, with a couple of clicks, you get you get your endpoint URL that can be consumed from wherever. So, uh, really easy. Yep. And is the is the um, is the platform on BetaQ and DataBricks the only platform that you're using, or do you use another collaboration platform for analysts and data scientists? Um, so far, we're using uh, the Taiku. As the main collaboration platform we 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 use databricks for um for for using a spark if we need to 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 push some jobs there uh with the spark we also use kubernetes if we want to leverage uh, gpu uh but for the rest the, the, the most of the job is done in in dataiku which which makes sense you want a centralized tool uh, with all the knowledge, all the all the projects, all the tasks there, and we only use that DataBricks and, and, and Kubernetes if we need uh, extra processing power, so to say. But the work, the job is is, is done. The, all the collaboration, all the uh, development is done in that type. Great, thank you very much. I think there was one more question regarding Data IQ. Let me try to find it. Um, oh, yeah, I think it was about AWS. So, yes, 
it would also be possible to deploy um, the same platform into AWS. You can find DataIQ on the AWS marketplace. And then there was another question for you, Ali. Can ML Studio or Azure ML be used with on-prem vertical database? So that's a quite specific technical question. I don't know if you want to reply to that right yes, now. Yes, yes. Yeah, I can cover it very quickly. So yes, uh, Azure Machine Learning can integrate with on-premise databases. You would just need to install a data management gateway on-prem and register that gateway with Azure Machine Learning Service. So yes. Great, thank you very much. And then perhaps it's one last question, um, Jesus, for you. In the lesson learned part, you were speaking about Databricks. Can you perhaps really quickly elaborate on the biggest challenges that you had in the integration with Databricks? Well, uh, if that is not too technical. There were uh, many, many uh, challenges. The problem is that uh, for this project was the first time we we used this this um, this connection. We we had to to put all the pieces in place, and uh, it took some time. Um, there were many challenges, uh, most of them very, very technical, yes. But I would say once you have things in place, it shouldn't be a pain, right? Uh, for the first time, it took some time, um, and it was actually not very easy. So many technical issues uh, popped up. But uh, once you have things in place, it's, it shouldn't be a big issue. So uh, we, are, we are using this in other projects uh, uh, with, with, without these this problems. All right, thank you very much. So I think, um, given the time, I'm sorry that we cannot get through all of the questions. And unfortunately, as this is anonymous, I won't be able to follow up with you separately to answer the questions that still remain open. Just to let you know, you will receive a follow-up email for this webinar from DataIQ, where you can also see the recording. So yes, there is a recording that you can watch on the Bright Talk um, website, like you are doing right now. Um, and if you have any questions, please just reply to this email that you will receive. And I will then either pass it on to Ali or to Jesus or reply to this question myself if I can. And again, there are some attachments and links that you can download for more information about AI in supply chain, about DataIQ, and the collaboration with Microsoft. And what else? What did I want to say? Anything else? No. Again, there will be a recording, and you can watch the webinar later again. And um, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you very much, Jesus. I think it was great. And thank, thank you. you very much to each and every one of you to participate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.